I hope my iPad's turned up, I hope. I forgot to check the volume on the iPad, but that's okay, that's okay. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Minister Gloria Harlow Drummond from uh, Jesus, is the Answer, Jesus is the Answer Ministries. I'm excited this afternoon. I'm very excited this afternoon. And this is January the 21st of <clears throat> 2020. And I have a word. I've been in prayer about uh, that God would, would send something for me to talk to you guys about. And the way that it happened was he sent something to me via phone. Via phone. Whoops. Whoops, 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 whoops. I gotta go back. Oh, wait a minute. <clears throat> it's okay. It's all good. It's all good. And I'm on my iPad. I'm on my iPad, everybody. So, okay. So bear with me. I have been ill the last few days. I've, I've been battling a cold. So bear with me. So... I'm going to start this off with the Lord's Prayer, or the Disciples' Prayer. So, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen and amen. And they all said, they all said, Amen. Okay. He never ceases to amaze me. He never ceases to amaze me. So, anyway, I want to let it be known again that I am on Twitch. Uh, preaching for Jesus. I'm on Twitch. And I'm also on, you know, the other, the other. I'm excited. I'm excited because I, I want to read this. All right, this is uh, shared by Teresa Hay, Royal Daughters of Destiny Prophetic Outreach. And it's, the post was written by Abraham Peters, is who the post was written by. The title of it is God Calls Women to Ministry. God Calls Women to Ministry. So sit back, relax, get your snacks, get your coffee, your tea, whatever. Uh, and as I read this, because it's it's quite long, it's quite long, but well worth it. I started writing it down, and I was in the bedroom earlier, and it seemed like the Holy Spirit said, just go on there and read it. I'm still going to copy it, but he said, just go on there and read it. Okay, I'll go on there and read it. So here we go. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right, here we go, you guys. Here we go. Understanding your identity in Christ gives divine purpose. God has a specific purpose for each of us, a unique calling for each individual. Now, um, I even went to Walmart, so he may be back here in a little bit, and the dogs may bark a little bit, so we'll have to just... When he says go, I go. You know, I, I, I do it as soon as the Holy Spirit leads me to do it. So, all right. God has a specific purpose for each of us, a unique calling for each individual. Our shared and primary purpose is to become disciples, followers of Jesus Christ. Our secondary callings are unique and are birthed out of our submission to the primary calling. The recent discussion about women in ministry shows the level of ignorance and traditions still ruling in some churches. Still ruling in some churches. While John MacArthur may have good insight on some dogmatic doctrines of the Bible, it is clear that he filters his beliefs and teachings through the religious spirit, tradition, denominational filter of the specific group he is affiliated with. I wonder if the fundamentalist John MacArthur would tell Priscilla of the New Testament to go home instead of mentoring Apollos. Get your twisted theological theories out of here and apologize to those insulted women preachers. 
who against all odds have risen courageously to fulfill God's mandates for their lives. It is possible to have great understanding of certain Bible truths and be blind or refuse to acknowledge others. Well, frankly and most truthfully, we have to stop acting like, like just because someone is a renowned scholar, theologian, that they can't miss the heart of God. They can't miss the heart of God. Okay, hold on a minute. I would lose my place. No one knew or studied the scripture more than the religious sect, Sadducee and Pharisees, yet they missed the Son of God standing right in front of them. Another good example is his doctrinal error, E-R-R-O-R, -R, in regard to the baptism of the Holy Spirit and speaking in tongues. Pray for this pastor that he may see clearly. That he may see clearly. Okay. The body of Christ misses out when we attempt to force all women into one constrained understanding of the role and responsibilities of women. Christ's transformation does not mean we blindly do as other good and godly people say we should. Say we should. If we are simply content to go along just to get along, we will never come to realize our true purpose in life. A great mentor and a safe community of believers will consistently point us to Christ and challenge us to follow him as we seek clarity on our faith journeys. A godly mentor models Christ's character while calling us to completely surrender our will and desires to God, to God's, to God's will for our lives. To God's will for our lives. All right, Acts 2.17, and this is the Passion Trans Translation, the TPT. Okay. This is what I will do in the last days. I will pour out my spirit on everybody and cause your sons and daughters to prophesy. And young men will see visions and your old men will experience dreams from God. Joel 2.28 God is the creator of all things. That picture's not very good on it for some reason. Maybe it's because the sun, I've got the, uh, the overhead light and the sun's trying to come through too. But anyway. Okay, God is the creator of all things and his creative vision is big enough to include women from all walks and stages of life, from different backgrounds and cultures. His kingdom purposes transcend generations. He, his will is big enough to include young girls like Rhoda who commit themselves to prayer and virgins like Mary, the young mother of Jesus. His plans are big enough for women for, like Elizabeth, Rachel, and Hannah, all of whom experienced prolonged seasons of infertility. His purposes include women with pagan pasts like Ruth, prostitutes like Rahab, and rejected, widowed, and adulterous women like the Samaritan woman at the well. He sees marginalized and enslaved women like Hagar, and old women like the prophetess Anna. We compassionately embrace women like these because God's purpose and plans include all of them. God's purpose includes you as well. You as well. Boy, this... Oh, well, maybe it'll straighten out. You as well. Okay. It's all right. Sadly, we live in a world where women constantly receive negative messages of naysayers, voices that communicate. You are not valuable. You're not smart enough for this job or capable enough to earn that amount of income. You are not skinny enough to fit into those jeans. Hold on. You are not attractive enough to date that guy or to have a man fully commit to only you. You are not competent enough to be a leader. You are not a great parent. You are not an excellent wife. And when we feel insecure or feel inadequate, it is easy to degrade or reject women who are either more competent than we are or have made different choices from our own. This rejection somehow makes women feel better about themselves and more comfortable with their choices if only for a moment. If only for a moment. Does this happen in, in the church? Does this happen in the church? Of course it does. This monster rears its ugly head in the guise of comparison and envy. In a shallow attempt to feel better about ourselves, women play games of one-upmanship. This intragender division research reveals that most women lack confidence in their own skills, ability, abilities, and choices. And their identity in Christ is not secure. Is not secure. 
As a result, we add to the mounting list of things our sisters in Christ should be doing to gain our approval and acceptance. Young single girls should go to college or to the mission field. Married women should have children, and the more they can have, the better. Mothers tend to get an extra wink for staying at home or choosing to homeschool. And what about the multitudes of women? Some lost, some barren, some college students, some single, some old, some divorced, some widows, some single mothers who come to church and sit on the sidelines waiting for someone to notice them and invite them in. These women are no different from one another in that they want embracing and they need encouragement and direction concerning their role in God's kingdom. Yes, amen. Amen. Okay. The more you learn, the better you will understand that God reveals his will for each of our lives in very specific ways at opportune times. The gifts of God, however, are given for serving the people of God, and it is for this reason and purpose that we should labor. There is a significant difference between living my life on purpose and aimlessly moving through life without direction. I am able to do the former because I have been embraced and nurtured within Christian communities where God was clearly at work. First, I committed to the primary calling of being a disciple and follower of Christ, and only then did I, clear, did I get clarity about my purpose of, or role in God's kingdom. In God's kingdom. I think that's because the, light, the light's on, I think. The word made plain. This is, this is awesome. This is absolutely awesome. The biblical narrative makes it clear that God does not call women to the same choices or, or life paths. However, he does call us all to follow him. He does call us all to a united Christian community. Our spiritual journeys are really about serving a God who is good and about knowing without a shadow of a doubt that through Christ's finished work on the cross, we are made righteous before that same God. Through salvation, God himself has done a great work in us. Our faith tells us he has great plans for us. Because of our faith and through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are equipped to, per to persevere and to work. In spite of our challenges and our suffering, we can live with power, hope, and joy as he intends. Ment mentoring can be a catalyst God uses to deepen our relational commitment to other women and to his church. Mentoring is intentional discipleship, affirms our true identity in Christ, and reminds us of the power of the Holy Spirit at work in community through us. Wow. To practice this theological truth, we must understand God's loving message and posture or of embrace towards all women. Towards all women. To the single women, your singleness is a gift from the Lord, even when it doesn't feel that way. Be generous with your gifts and treasure the time God has given you to worship Him without distraction. Worship Him without distraction. To the wives, God doesn't just want to change your husband to give him a hope and a future. God wants to transform you as well. Look up in reverence to God. Watch and pray. Watch and pray. To the widows, God understands you have suffered an extreme loss. Take time to grieve and care for your soul and understand that your loss is not the end of the journey. God still has a purpose for you and he will comfort you and give you peace and give you peace. To the single mothers, God sees you, like Hagar, lost in the desert with a crying baby and no resources. God will provide for you and your children. Trust him and obey. Trust him and obey. To the barren women, God is with you in your trial. He accepts you and you will be fruitful for his kingdom. Throughout the Bible, God used countless faithful women like Miriam, the prophetess, Huldah, Mary of Bethany, Priscilla, and we don't know if they ever had children. To the mothers, you are not in charge of your children's salvation. God is. After a certain point in life, you are not even responsible for their choices. They are. Model for them a life devoted to God. Train them and release them to God's care. To God's care. All right. To the women who took, to the women who work outside the home, like Deborah and the model of the Proverbs, 31 woman God has enlarged your territory do not take your opportunities to influence lightly 
Glorify God in your work. Yes, in everything we do. Glorify God in your work. Amen. To the older women. To the older women. There is no such thing as retiring from God's kingdom work. Run your race faithfully until the end. Walk, roll, or limp if necessary, but don't give up on the journey. Remain faithful and diligent. Take women under your wings and be an example of how to finish well. To the younger women, respect your elders. Sit at their feet and learn from them. There is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.9 To all God's daughters everywhere, we have a responsibility to remember our identity in Christ and the work of the Lord in our lives. Since we are all created in the image of God, we must compassionately embrace God's message for all women. What makes a woman strong? How God prepared Deborah to lead. How God prepared Deborah to lead. God delights in strong women. We, we in the church should, too. Our celebration of strong women in the body of Christ should be heard loud and clear. What needs to be heard as well is a joyful embracing of what the Bible celebrates as a strong woman. There's no biblical formula for a strong, godly woman. But as the Spirit opens our eyes, we can dig relentlessly into God's revelation to get a clearer and clearer view. The story of Deborah in Judges 4 and 5. This strong woman stands out, one of a few mentioned prophetesses and the only mentioned female judge of Israel arguably the godliest one. I love the picture of Deborah, wife of Lapid Lapidoth, sitting at work under that palm tree in the hill country of Ephraim. And the people of Israel came up to her came up to her for judgment. That's Judges chapter four verses four and five. Here is a strong woman used by God to exercise strate strategic leadership among God's people. This is beautiful and important for us to see. The more we see just how the Bible shows us Deborah's strength, the better we see its beauty, beauty and importance. To this end, let's make four, four observations about the story of a strong woman. Deborah's story lifts our eyes to God. Deborah is part of a bigger story. Deborah is part of a bigger story. When we meet Deborah, we meet part of the seed of Abraham that God promised to grow and bless. The people of Israel have God's word and are settled in the land he promised. On the way to becoming a great kingdom through which God will bless the nations of this fallen world. But in the book of Judges, this, they disobey him again and again, growing from bad to worse. Take me a drink of coffee. Hang on just a second. It's a long one. It's a long post. But it's well, it's well worth it. It's well worth it. Okay, here we go. Each time they turn from the Lord, he allows enemy nations to oppress them. But each time they cry out to him for help, he rescues them. Deborah takes part in one of these rescues. She did not know it, but all these rescues pointed to the one great rescue God would accomplish finally through that promised seed, his own son. Deborah was part of a people who were part of God's redemptive plan for humanity, <clears throat> and she faithfully played her part. I start here in celebrating this strong woman, because human strength, as Scripture shows it, is only derived strength. There is no strength but that given by the Creator, <coughs> God, in whom is life and strength eternal. He is the only source. Out of a fallen world of sinners, <clears throat> he chooses a people to save and to use for his saving purposes. Deborah is, first of all, a part of that chosen people. Let's not even begin to talk about strong women or men apart from this bigger story of what God is doing, of what God is doing. The story of Deborah isn't mainly about Deborah. The primary and sovereign actor in this story is God. It's a great exercise. Read Judges 4 and 5, making all the references to God. From the introduction, John's J Judges chapter 4, verses 1 and 2, to the climax, Judges chapter 4, four uh, verses 4 and 15. Judges chapter 4, verses 4, 14 and 15. To the conclusion, Judges chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, this story is about what God is doing. 
your stories about what is God is doing, and I don't see my thing in the background, but that's okay. When we celebrate the strength of Deborah, we celebrate first all powerful God in whose Deborah's story takes part, takes part, takes part. Deborah speaks God's word. I love this. I love it. Deborah not only comes in the flow of God's word, but she herself speaks God's word. Of course, that was what true prophets did. They spoke the word of the Lord as he gave it to them. And that's what we see Deborah doing through this, throughout this story. Calling Barak, or Barak to battle against Sisera, she calls, Has not the Lord, the God of Israel, commanded you? Judges chapter 4, verse 6. In commands, Judges chapter 4, verses 6 and 14. Judgments, Judges chapter 4, verse 9. And promises, Judges chapter 4, verses 7 and 14. Deborah's mouth overflows with God's word. When we celebrate the strength of Deborah, we celebrate a woman on whose tongue lay God's word. Of course, in Deborah's time, the written word was not yet complete, and God spoke at many times and in many ways by his prophets. Whereas now, in these last days, God has spoken to us by his Son. Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 and 2. The scriptures revealing that son are complete. On the tongue of today's strong women or men is the word of God in the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. Testaments. Deborah obeys God's word. Beautiful. Deborah not only speaks God's word, she obeys it. Along with her words is evident a heart of submission to God's revealed plan. Specifically, God's revealed leaders. God has commanded Barak to lead out Israel's army as deliverer of Israel. Deborah herself has communicated that command. That command. Wow. She clearly respects and embraces Barak's God-ordained role. Even when Barak is afraid to obey, Deborah does not belittle or replace him. Rather, she helps him. She immediately agrees to go with him as he asks. Now, she does, she does give God's judgment <clears throat> on Barak's weakness. Caesarea, Caesarea himself will die, not by Barak's hand, but by the hand of another strong woman, Jael. The two strong women book in the narrative like pillars holding up the house. It might not seem fair that in Hebrews 11, Hall of Faith is fearful Barak who gets the call out in the role of the faithful. <whistles> Hebrews 11.32 I don't think Deborah would have minded. In fact, this is what Deborah was after, to lift up Israel's leaders, to encourage them and help them act like leaders. Wow. Deborah sings God's word. Deborah sings God's word. We know this about Deborah not only from her interaction with Barak, but also from her song. Deborah speaks God's word. She obeys it, and finally she sings it. As we move from the narrative of chapter 4 to the poetry of chapter 5, Deborah first praises God for Israel's leaders who faithfully came out to battle. That the leaders took the lead in Israel. That, that the people offered themselves willingly. Bless the Lord, Judges 5, 2. Deborah not only praises God for the men who did lead in verses 16 and 17, she also names and reproaches the ones who did not. Verse 9 reveals her heart for God, God's ordained leaders. My heart goes out to the commanders of Israel who offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless the Lord. Judges 5, 9. Most basically, this spirit-inspired poetry shows a heart turned toward the Lord God and his purpose, using imagery that recalls the, the exodus. Deborah sings glory to God for his deliverance of his people, including the destruction of their enemies. She praises him for accomplishing those purposes through willing male leaders, through Jael, most blessed of women, and through herself, a mother in Israel. Judges chapter 5, verses 4 through 7, 21 through 31, and 24 through 31. Deborah reveals in the blessing of both women and men offering themselves willingly to the Lord to do the distinct jobs he calls them to do. Amen. Hallelujah. When we celebrate the strength of Deborah, we celebrate a woman who speaks and obeys God's word and who sings it with her heart. Through her song, Deborah 
bears witness to the ways God uses men and women to serve him. And every kind of serving re requires great strength. Read those verses Deborah sings about Jael. Talk about expertise, not only with a workman's mallet and tent peg, but with an inspired poet's power to craft words that pierce the heart. The encouragement of Deborah. This is awesome. Judges, Judges 4 and 5 remind me to look first to my, to my all-powerful creator and redeemer, whose word ordains my days. I'm living in, in his story. As a man specifically, I am encouraged to see how God distinctly prepares, calls, and uses men and women. I pray for all of God's children to serve faithfully as a word-filled man and woman. I pray for the heart of the men God calls as spiritual leaders of the church, according to the Apostle Paul's teaching. They are imperfect and sometimes weak. Sometimes weak. May everyone bless God for his saving purposes in calling his people to serve our perfect deliverer together. And may we be prepared to wage spiritual battle along with, with and in every way possible, helping the overseers chosen to lead the body of Christ. Like Deborah, may more and more strong godly women speak the word, obey it, and sing it with all their hearts for the glory of Christ our Lord. Jesus' countercultural view of women. The place of women in the first century Rome world and in Jude Jude Judaism has been well documented and set forth in several recent books. Most frequently, women were regarded as second-class citizens. Jesus' Jesus's regard for women was much different from that of his contemporaries. Evans terms Jesus' approach to women as a revolutionary for his era, but was his treatment of women out of character with Old Testament revelation or with later New Testament practice? Other chapters in this volume will show that it was not. Disciples come in two sexes, male and female. Amen, hallelujah. Amen, hallelujah. For Christ, women have an intrinsic value equal to that of men. Jesus said, at the beginning of the Creator, at the beginning the Creator made them male and female. Matthew 19, verses 4. Generation, G Genesis Genesis chapter 1 verse 27 women are created in the image of God just as men are like men they have self-awareness personal freedom a measure of self-determination and personal responsibility for their actions for Christ women have an intrinsic value equal to that of men Jesus came to earth not not primarily as a male but as a person he treated women not primarily as females but as human beings Jesus recognized women as fellow human beings. Disciples come in two sexes, male and female. Females are seen by Jesus as genuine persons, not simply as objects of male desire. The foundation stone of Jesus' attitude toward women was his vision of them as persons to whom and for whom he had come. He did not perceive them primarily in terms of their sex, age, or marital status. He seems to have considered them in terms of their relation or lack of one to God. Three clear examples. I, I love this. Three clear examples. Examples of this even-handed treatment of women by Jesus are found in the four Gospels. Are found in the four Gospels. First, Jesus regularly addressed women directly while in public. This was unusual for a man to do, and that's in reference to John 4.27. The disciples were amazed to see Jesus talking with the Samaritan woman at the well of Scott of Scott Sychar, John 4, verses 7 through 26. He also spoke freely with the woman taken in adultery. Taken in adultery. Okay. And that's John chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. Okay. 6. Luke who gives ample attention to women in his gospel, notes that Jesus spoke publicly with the widow of Nain, and that's Luke chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. The woman with the bleeding disorder, Luke 8, 48, Matthew 9, 22, Mark 5, 34, and a woman who called to him from a crowd, Luke chapter 11, verses 27 and 28. Similarly, similarly Jesus addressed a woman bent over for 18 years, Luke 13, 12, 
and a group of women on the route to the cross. Luke 23, verses 27 through 31. A second aspect of Jesus' Jesus's regard for the full intrinsic value of women is seen in how he spoke to the women he addressed. He spoke in a thoughtful, caring manner. Each synoptic writer record, records Jesus addressing the woman with the bleeding disorder tenderly as daughter. References above and referring to the bent woman as a daughter of Abraham. Luke 13, 16. Bloich infers that Jesus called the Jewish women daughters of Abraham, Luke 13, 16, thereby according them a spiritual status equal to that of men. All right, seven. Third, Jesus did not gloss over sin in the lives of the women he met. He held women personally responsible for their own sin as seen in his dealings with the woman at the well, John chapter 4, verses 16, 16 through 18. The woman taken in adultery, John chapter 8, verses 10 and 11. And the sinful woman who anointed his feet, Luke chapter 7, verses 44 through 50. Their sin was not condoned, but con confronted. Each had the personal freedom and a measure of self-determination to deal with the issues of sin, repentance, and forgiveness. Jesus' valuation of women today. Of women today. Even though clear role distinction is seen in Christ's choice of the apostles and in the exclusive type of work they were given to perform, no barriers need exist between a believer and the Lord Jesus Christ. Regardless of gender, Jesus demonstrated only the highest regard for women in both his life and teaching. He recognized the intrinsic equality of men and women and continually showed the worth and dignity of women as persons. Jesus valued their fellowship, prayers, service, financial support, testimony, and witness. He honored women, taught women, and ministered to women in thoughtful ways. As a result, women responded warmly to Jesus' ministry. Have things changed too drastically today for us to see this same Jesus? Not at all. Modern women can find the same rich fulfillment in serving Christ as did the Marys and Marthas of Judea or the or the Joannas and Susannas of Galilee. What the Holy Bible says about women minister. What the Holy Bible says about women minister. There is perhaps no more hotly debated issue in this church, in the church today, than the issue of women serving as pastors. As a result, it is very important to not see this issue as men versus women. There are women who believe women should not serve as pastors and that the Bible places restrictions on the ministry of women. And there are men who believe women can serve as pastors and that there are no restrictions on women in ministry. This is not an issue of chauvinism or discrimination. It is an issue of biblical interpretation. The Word of God proclaims a woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man. She must be silent. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. In the church, God assigns different roles to men and women. This is a result, result of the way mankind was treated, was created, and the way in which sin entered the world. 1 Timothy, uh, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. God, through the Apostle Paul, restricts women from serving in roles of teaching and or having spiritual authority over men. This pre precludes women from serving as pastors over men, which definitely includes preaching to them, teaching them publicly, and exercising spiritual authority over them. There are many objections to this view of women in pastoral ministry. A common one is that Paul restricts women from teaching because in the first century women were typically uneducated. However, 1 Timothy chapter 2 verses 11 through 14 nowhere mentions educational status. If education were if education were a qualification for ministry, then the majority of Jesus' disciples would not have been qualified. A second common objection is that Paul only restricted the women of Ephesus from teaching men. 1 Timothy was written to Timothy, the pastor of the church of Ephesus. Ephesus was known for its temple to Ar Artemis, and women were the, author in the authorities in that branch of paganism. Therefore, the theory goes, Paul was only reacting against the female-led customs of the Ephesian idolaters, and the church needed to be different. However, the book of 1 Timothy nowhere mentions Artemis, nor does Paul mention the standard practice of the Artemis worshipers as a reason for the restrictions in 1 Timothy 
chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. Okay, a third objection is that Paul is only referring to husbands and wives, not men and women in general. The Greek words for woman and man in 1 Timothy 2 could refer to husbands and wives. However, the basic meaning of the word is broader than that. Further, the same Greek words are used in verses 8 through 10, are only husbands to lift up holy hands in prayer without anger and disputing, are only wives to dress modestly, have good deeds, and worship God. Verses 9 and 10, of course not. Verses 8 through 10 clearly refer to all men and women, not just husbands and wives. There is nothing in the context that would indicate a narrowing to husbands and wives in verses 11 through 14. Yet another ob objection to this interpretation of women in pastoral ministry is in relation to women who held positions of leadership in the Bible, specifically Miriam, Deborah, and Huldah in the Old Testament. It is true that these women were chosen by God for special service to Him and that they stand as models of faith, courage, and yes, leadership. However, the authority of woman in the Old Testament is not relevant to the issue of pastors in the church. The New Testament epistles present a new paradigm for God's people, the church, the body of Christ. And that paradigm involves an authority structure unique to the church, not for the nation of Israel or any other Old Testament, Old Testament entity. This is awesome. I have, this, this is awesome. Similar arguments are made using Priscilla and Phoebe in the New Testament. In Acts 18, Priscilla and Aquila are presented as faithful ministers for Christ. Priscilla's name is mentioned first, perhaps indicating that she was more prominent in ministry than her husband. Did Priscilla and her husband teach the gospel of Jesus Christ to Apollos? Yes, in their home they explained to him the way of God more adequately. And that's Acts 18.26. Does the Bible ever say that Priscilla pastored at a church or taught publicly or became the spiritual leader of a congregation of saints? No. As far as we know, Priscilla was not involved in ministry activity in contradiction to 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14. In Romans 16, 1, Phoebe is called a deacon or servant in the church and is high, highly commended by Paul. But as with Priscilla, there is nothing in Scripture to indicate that Phoebe was a pastor or a teacher of men in the church. Able to teach is given as a qualification for elders, but not for deacons. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13, Titus, I better switch hands. Titus chapter 1, verses 6, 6 through 9. The structure of 1 Timothy 2, 11 through 14, makes the reason why women cannot be pastors perfectly clear. Verses, verse 13 begins with forgiving, and I gotta switch back. <clears throat> okay, verse 13 begins with forgiving the cause of Paul's statement in verses 11 and 12. Why should women, why should women not teach or have authority over men? Because Adam was created first, then Eve, and Adam was not the one deceived. It was the woman who was deceived. Verses 13 and 14. God created Adam first and then created Eve to be a helper for Adam. The order of creation has universal application in the family. Ephesians chapter 5, verses 22 through 33, and in the church. The fact that Eve was deceived is also given in 1 Timothy 2.14, as a reason for women not serving as pastors or having spiritual authority over men. This does not mean that women are gullible or that they are all more easily deceived than men. If all women are more easily deceived, why would they be allowed to teach children who are easily deceived and other women who are supposedly more easily deceived? The text simply says that women are not to teach men or have spiritual authority over men because Eve was deceived. God has chosen to give men the primary teaching authority in the church. Okay, many women excel in gifts of hospitality, mercy, teaching, evangelism, and helping, serving. Much of the ministry of the local church depends on a woman. Women in the church are not restricted from public praying or prophesying, and that's 1 Corinthians 11.5, only from having spiritual teaching authority over men. The Bible nowhere restricts women from exercising the gifts of the Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 12. Women, just as much as men, are called to minister to others, to demonstrate the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23, and to proclaim the gospel to the lost, and that's Matthew 28, verses 18, 18 through 20, Acts 1, 8, and 1 Peter three fifteen. 
God has ordained that, whole, that only men are to serve in positions of spiritual teaching authority in the church. This is not because men are necessarily better teachers or because women are inferior or less intelligent, which is not the case. It is simply the way God designed the church to function. Men are to set the example in spiritual leadership in their lives and through their words. Women are to take a less authority, authoritative role. Women are encouraged to teach other women, Titus, Titus chapter 2, verses 3 through 5. The Bible also does not restrict women from teaching children. The only activity women are restricted from is teaching or having spiritual authority over men. And I would never try to have authority over men. This, prelude, this precludes women from serving as pastors to men. This does not make woman, women less important by any means, but rather gives from a ministry focus more in agreement with God's plan and his gifting of them. In the final analysis, women can function in the capacity of their ministerial calling, but would be, not, but would be overseen or co covering by a man of God. Do not allow neither except anyone to make you feel that you are not fit for the use of the Lord because you were created on purpose for God's divine purpose. Amen. Amen. And I am not married. I'm not married. And I would never try to usurp authority over any man. For any, over any man. But a woman can minister the word. A woman can minister the word. Amen. Hallelujah. This was an absolutely awesome awesome post and it was a long one it was a long one i think i counted 54 paragraphs to this well it must be it took me almost 42 minutes to to, to, to read it so this was this was pretty awesome but i was called i was called by by god to preach his word that's it to preach the gospel go to the highways the byways and preach the gospel never to usurp authority over a man Never. Never. Just like I know that there are, there are not women apostles. There's not mi women bishops. Some, some things aren't women's positions. And I know that. I know that. But as far as preaching God's word, yes, I can preach God's word. And that's what I am doing. That is what I am doing. But this was one awesome post. One awesome post. I love you all with the love of Christ. With the love of Christ. And may God richly, richly bless you all. Feel free to leave me your comments. And like I've said before, like I've said, leave me your comments. Leave me your prayer, prayer requests. I'll be happy to pray for you. And remember, <clears throat> I'm also on Periscope, Twitch, Facebook, Instagram, so you can you can you can contact me. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I love you all in Christ in Christ with Christ's love, in Christ's love. This is Minister Gloria Harlow Drummond. Again, today is January the twenty first of two thousand and twenty. Again, be blessed. Be blessed the rest of the week. And be kind loving lift one another up pray for one another do good do good to those bless those who, who, who curse us bless them you know if they strike you on one cheek let them have the other cheek too you know so anyway i love you guys very very much with all my heart with all my heart but jesus is number one he's number one in this woman's life number one so, in the, again, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, I'm going to let you go. Again, come to Twitch, because I'm, I'm on Twitch. I have four videos up now. I have four up on Twitch. So, check it out over there. It's easy. It's, it's an app. So, alrighty. I love you guys. Until later. Okay. Bye-bye.